We have Daniel Krawitz. Uh, I, I, you, you may, maybe you saw Daniel yesterday. Um, he's uh, going to tell us about uh, crypto anarchy. He's got kind of a, a, a hodgepodge presentation with a number of different technologies and implementations. Um, as with all three, uh, all three presentations, uh, there is uh, sort of a degree of, of knowledge that's going to be assumed. Uh, if you, you know, if you feel like you're having to um, play catch up or something, you know, that, that's fine. And obviously all three speakers will uh, kind of try to, to gauge the audience. But as you think of questions for them, um, you know, try to try not to ask questions that, you know, you can easily just go and Google, right? We've got three amazing experts here and we want to kind of allow you to, uh, to pick their brain. So again, this is the Crypto Anarchy track. My name is Justin Holmes. I'm from Slashroot in New York. Uh, we will be here all day. Uh, and first we have Daniel Krawitz with Crypto Anarchy. Take it away, Daniel. Hello, thank you. Can you all hear me? Sounds good. So my talk is called uh, Crypto Anarchy. This is what's going to work, so drop whatever you're doing and get on board. So, um, sounds like, okay. They, so la last night I, I, you know, I went to dinner and I, I discovered that I was sitting with uh, Naomi Wolf, Thomas Drake, and uh, Jessalyn Raddick. So I was like, oh my god, these people are so cool. <laughs> what am I going to say? But then we spent the entire time with me explaining Bitcoin to them. <laughs> so <laughs> that's... <laughs> So that should, that should give you an idea of how, how interesting this stuff is. Did you have to uh -oh. buy her a beer? What? Did you have to buy her a beer? Uh, uh, I did not, did not buy anybody beers. Okay, so this, uh, oh, it works. Okay, good. So, okay, here's my definition of crypto anarchist. Uh, either someone who promotes anarchy through online anonymity or someone who is promoting anarchy without realizing it in the same sense of crypto fascist. Right? So, someone who promotes Bitcoin who is not an anarchist is a crypto anarchist because Bitcoin is inherently anarchistic. Um, we're going to see a lot of these, these crypto anarchists in the, in the Bitcoin movement, the, the second definition, well, both definitions. Uh, I I anyway, so um, there are sort of two ideas about um, the, you know, the concept behind crypto anarchy, they're related. They're all based on, on using cryptography for, uh, to, to manage our, our social relations rather than sort of, you know, a centralized organization that, uh, that just sort of says what, what things are, how, how they work, right? So originally, the idea more, focused more on anonymity, um, but later, people started to realize that, that you can also use cryptography for purposes that don't really require anonymity. Anonymity helps. But, you know, if you have, say, a, a property registration system that says who owns what, and it's not anonymous, if, if people listen to it and they believe what it says, and uh, the government can't hack it because you can't falsify a digital signature, then, it, you know, then that's, that's a lot of protection even if, even if the government steals a bunch of stuff because it's still, it's still registered as, to the person it correctly belongs to. So, um, uh, and I think this, the, second, the second idea is really more important. An our, uh, anonymity is great, but what we, what, what really helps is, um, you know, creating, creating our social relations in, in a way that the, the government can't hack. If, it, you know, then uh, you don't really need to be anonymous quite as much. I mean, they can just go after you, but, but if, they can't, if they can't hack the, uh, the, um, the property registration system, that's a big deal. So I, I sort of call this idea social reality. So here's the idea. Um, why, is, uh, why is Barack Obama president of the United States? The answer is because everybody says so. Like if everybody just said he's not the president of the United States, then he wouldn't be. 
So the con like the Constitution, that doesn't, that's, you know, that's the story that we talk about. Um, but ultimately, it, you know, you don't have to think about the, you know, the birth certificate conspiracy theories. You just say, oh, he isn't. And that's, that's that. And the way the, the government stays in control, of course, we always talk about force and their power to, uh, you know, kidnap and shoot people and so on. But really, they can't do that to everybody very easily. They can't just directly act against everybody. They have to, they have to pick and choose who they're going to fight to try to keep everybody else scared. Um, if everybody just started ignoring the government, then it really, all of their, their force really wouldn't be effective. Uh, so, you know, when, when you're born, people sort of tell you that there are rules as to how society works. Well, that's just how we do things. Well, in reality, there, there are no rules. Uh, if we can just figure out new rules that uh, the government can't hack, then, then that's better. Just make up some new rules, right? So the problem with changing the rules is that heretofore, when, when people wanted to suggest new rules that didn't include the government at the center of them, you know, the government could just find those people and, and stop them. You know, you have to build like a movement with, that's organized with like leaders. You just, you, you, then you can infiltrate the movement and stop the people at the top. Um, but if we can just build a distributed system that has no center, then it's not, uh, it's not hackable in this way anymore. This is the basic idea. So, you know, uh, you know Naomi last night, it's really great, this leads right into this. You know, she was talking about how you have to organize. Well, Let's, let's not organize. We'll, let's just, the, the, the distributed system lets us, uh, lets us act collectively without organizations. So um, strategies for liberty, elections, lots of work easily subverted, make people feel like they're doing something when they're not. It's really just a scam. Just trick people into doing all of this uh, work, and they feel like, oh, well, at least I did something. No, you didn't. Intellectualism, okay, I think that's actually been working reasonably well, but way too slowly. So, okay, are we going to be able to see the bottom of the slide? Okay, this, this may be a problem if we can't see the bottom of my slides, but problem with agorism, can't do big business, leaves no room for activists, and you can't see the third line. That's a problem. Yeah, the third line of this slide said both of those previous two statements are completely wrong. Um, so, you know, when, when, when Rothbard wrote his critique of, uh, of agorism, uh, now the name, of, the name of the guy is blanking on me. Who, who wrote? Konkin. Konkin. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry. Yes. So those, that was Rothbard's critique of agorism, and this should go down as the, the worst thing that Rothbard said, is that you, you can't do big business and there isn't room for, for activists if you're an agorist. Um, but we can, we can do big, big business. Um, you know, Bitcoin changes everything. Um, so the, the real thing that's kind of magical about Bitcoin is that it, it, turns, uh, it turns free speech into a way of transferring value. Because, of course, messages on the Bitcoin network they're just messages, but they're also transfers of value. So this means that a censorship-resistant network, such as the Bitcoin network, is can, once, once we have a censorship-resistant network, we can turn it into a, a regulation-resistant business network. OK? And um, so the big, and of course, you know, if, if you're trying to resist, that's sort of a, a deprivation, right? Because you, you, you have to choose uh, something that's more dangerous and could get you in a lot of trouble. And you might, you might be leaving something, you know, um, something quite profitable in the regular economy. 
Well, with, with Bitcoin, we don't, we don't have that problem as much anymore. There's immediate benefits to switching to the Bitcoin economy. It's really just better just to, just to move over. So it's not like, you were, not like we're depriving ourselves anymore by becoming agorists. Um, so um, one, of the, one of the amazing things about Bitcoin is how the people who should be most uh, its greatest enemies don't, don't get it at all, and they're so totally skeptical that they're not mounting even a remotely effective resistance. Like, they don't even seem to get that this is like a problem for them yet. So we get all of these articles from bankers and MIT economists where they're like, oh, Bitcoin is terrible, but nobody's actually proposed anything on how to actually stop it. Like, they don't seem to understand that this is like a, a world where their word is not law anymore, right? They, they don't have the ability to just hack uh, society by, by saying that things should work one way, right? They don't, they don't have the ability to infiltrate the Bitcoin system just by, by talking. Um, proof of work is better than, than the Constitution, okay? <laughs> so, because you can't, you can't just lie about it and get away with it, okay? You know, um, you have to have that hash. Uh, so, um, I don't know, it's, it's really bizarre. Like, early on in the, the Bitcoin community, we kept, you know, we heard this all the time, oh, you know, Government's going to just crush Bitcoin, and like they didn't, and now it's kind of too late, I think. Uh, so hopefully, well, hopefully they'll they'll continue just complaining about it and just not not noticing that you have to do something else. So I hope they're not watching this. But so now uh, you know we all know how great Bitcoin is. Well, I hope so. I hope we have an inkling anyway. But Bitcoin is the culmination of a, a great libertarian tradition that has not yet been integrated in the libertarian, you know, mainstream, if you can call it that. Um, so this is really what, what, what I want people to, to focus on. There's really a great tradition, the cypherpunks and all of their ideas that led to Bitcoin, which, um, and, and this was all happening in the 80s and 90s, and none of the, you know, none of the, the mainstream libertarians really seemed to know much about it. I mean, it's partly their fault. Like, they didn't really seem to want to market their ideas that much. There aren't, like, cypherpunk books that I know of that came out around then. It's like they had this mailing list, came out with all these great ideas, and then what? Um, now we're starting to see some real fruit from this movement. Anyway, uh, cypherpunk movement, well, the, uh, the precursor was the emergence of academic cryptography, and there are two things that sort of started this. There's the publication of DES, which is the first public uh, open source, basically, uh, algorithm. It's not, I mean, it's open source because you can describe the algorithm and it's public. It's not, but it's not like it has a specific source to it, then you have to write it yourself. So academic study could proceed around it. A very strong algorithm is still one of the best that we have. Now you have to use triple DES, though, not just the regular kind. But it's still, if you do that, it's really good. Uh, and the development of public key cryptography. And this is um, Whitfield Diffie, a great libertarian, not well enough known among libertarians. One of, one of the inventors of public key cryptography uh, actually the, the British Secret Service did it first, but they didn't tell anybody until 1997. So, you know, also they didn't come up with all of the individualistic ideas that you can do with public key cryptography, such as digital signatures and key distribution without a central authority. Anyway, if you don't understand that, uh, read, read the book, uh, Applied Cryptography by Bruce Schneier. I recommend that later, but just keep that in mind. So then the cypherpunk movement started when some of these, uh, these early academic cryptographers started realizing 
that there are some real individualistic implications to cryptography. So, uh, you know, the first, the first guy is David Chaum. He, he, he did all kinds of great things. He proposed the idea of digital cash. He invented blind signatures. What, what this means is that essentially I can be, uh, I, I can add a digital signature to a document without, without reading it. The document is encrypted, but I can still prove that I saw it. So that, that drastically removes, uh, that, that separates the, uh, the services of you know, being a witness and knowing what's actually going on. So you know, I can prove that, that there was a contract bef without knowing what's in the contract. Uh, he helped invent zero knowledge arguments. That, that means that I can prove to you that I, I know something without telling you what it is. I, have, I definitely have the solution to some problem, but I'm not telling you what it is. You're convinced that I have it, uh, but you don't know what, what the answer is. Uh, so Tim, Tim May sort of came up with the overall idea of a crypto anarchy. He invented the word. He spelled it with two words. I, I just put it together into one word without a hyphen. And that's my contribution so far. <laughs> uh, he wrote some really great, uh, great works that you should read. The Cyphernomicon, that's a great book. It's actually completely unreadable. It's, it's, it's like something written by Wittgenstein. But uh, that's an advanced work. So you might, might try it later. Um, and uh, Eric Hughes wrote the Cypherpunk Manifesto and made the first anonymous remailer. So in the Cypherpunk movement, there's always been sort of a big gap between theory and application. Because by this time, we had already had basically the design for something like Tor. It was already written about. Uh, Chaum came up with it. I didn't even write that down in the list. But the first anonymous re remailer was like a ridiculous hack. And it was easily subverted once, uh, you know, once, once the governments got, got wind of it. So we, there's still lots of these great ideas that are not built yet. And we need to get, get that stuff working. Uh, so later, we had people like Y. Dai, who in, uh, wrote a paper called B Money. An early, basically, it's a lot like Bitcoin. Nobody built it, but he pretty much had the ideas put together for something that would work. Um, then we have people like Nick Sabo, should read all of his stuff, it's really good. He's a social theorist, uh, theory of money and digital cash, and he invented the idea of a smart contract. That, that means that the, um, uh, the uh, well, I guess it's an adjudicator. The, the adjudicator for the contract, the one who says what, what happens is the program. It's not a person. So we want to have, have these as much as possible. Phil Zimmerman invented PGP, and Ian Grigg invented triple entry accounting, and he wrote about cypherpunk contract law. So triple entry accounting, what that basically means is, well, you know, you've heard of double entry bookkeeping. Um, the problem with double entry bookkeeping is if you're careful, you can uh, hide money in it. You can, you, if you remove the right amount from one side of the ledger and add it to the other side, then you can make it look like the, you can have money that's missing and make it look like it's not missing. So with triple entry accounting, um, you, you can't falsify your own ledger. And the items in the account are basically signed receipts from, the, uh, from, from your customers or from the other people that, that you're dealing with. And if you don't have that, that signed receipt, you can't, you can't alter your ledger. This, but this would have, uh, well, you may have heard of the problems that Mountain Gox is having now. Basically, they're, um, we don't know if they're solvent uh, and people are terrified and they're pretend, well, they're, they're saying that it's confidential whether they're solvent or not, which is a great answer. But uh, <laughs> if, if they used triple entry accounting, then, uh, you know, then we would know. And why, why we don't use that now is like crazy, because it's a great idea. 
So creation of Tor, it's a great thing. Uh, I talked about it yesterday. WikiLeaks, Julian Assange. So, you know, we all know who Julian Assange is, but we really need to go back and understand this, this tradition that he grew out of, this cypherpunk tradition. So I bet that many of you have not heard the names that were on the previous slide. Dang it. My slides don't fill up the whole screen. So Ross Ulbricht, he does not deserve to get his half his name cut off. He's a great libertarian. Um, this, is, this is what Satoshi Nakamoto looks like. Just by coincidence, he looks just like Jackie Chan. So Bitcoin is basically this, the, the technological singularity of the cypherpunk movement. It's, it's always been sort of the holy grail that people have been writing about, but nobody could get to work quite right until now. So now that we have the holy grail of the cypherpunk movement, we need to like push forward and get everything, get everything working, and we'll have a great digital economy that will be cheaper than the regular economy so that everybody will want to move into it whether, whether they care about agorism or not. So um, Bit Bitcoin is really subversive, right? Because it's so, it's so darn useful for things that have nothing to do with agorism. It's just great. So everybody's going to want to move into it eventually. And uh, you know, that, that'll, just make, that'll just make our purposes a lot easier, right? Uh, oh, okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the economics of Bitcoin. Anyway, I know there's a lot of Bitcoin talk going around here, so I hope I'm saying stuff that you haven't heard already. Uh, I think that there is not enough work done on the, the economics of Bitcoin yet, so hopefully this will be, uh, be worthwhile. The basic principle of the economics of Bitcoin is that Bitcoin gets objectively better the more investment there is in it. And this, this has to do with the concept of liquidity. A more liquid currency is one that you can spend a given value of it, or you can sell a given value of it more easily. So like um, houses are expensive, but they're not liquid. It can take months to sell a house. Uh, but if I have uh, enough dollars to buy a house, I can easily get rid of them for something else instantaneously. And uh, Bitcoin is not as liquid as the dollar, but if I have enough Bitcoins to buy a house, I could also easily sell them without affecting the market a lot. There's another, um, ah, I should have added it in here. This Metcalf's law is, is an idea about the network effect, which suggests that uh, the value of a network should go as roughly as the square of the size of the network. But there's another idea, I think it's Reed's law. Hopefully I got the, the name right. I'd, hopefully, there's a bunch of these laws, so hopefully I got that one right, which suggests that the network should grow, the value of the network should be exponential. I kind of think Metcalfe's law is the relevant one, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'll, uh, I'll accept arguments for, for Reed's law. I'm still looking into that, that idea. So, ah, so some Bitcoin fallacies, you see this around, people say, oh, you know, hoarding, that's bad. It's not bad. Just keep hoarding. Uh, you're, you're increasing the liquidity of, of Bitcoin the more, the more you invest. And the, the more you're trying to buy rather than sell, the, the more you're improving the Bitcoin economy. So don't listen to people who tell you that hoarding is bad. And another thing that people complain about is volatility. Don't worry about that either. Like the price of Bitcoin sh should go up as fast as possible. The faster the better because that's increasing liquidity. So, you know, stop worrying about that either. We have these periodic hype cycles as people learn about Bitcoin and uh, you know, when the price goes up by a factor of 10 and then it crashes by by half or more, uh, don't, don't worry about that. That's really not, it's a problem because it gets people annoyed when they buy in on the hype cycle and then they immediately start losing, losing value, but that's, that's their problem, that's not Bitcoin's problem. And the other thing is ignore all of the altcoins if you've heard of these, this is my personal vendetta, but, but basically uh, there are all these Bitcoin knockoffs that, uh, they're, they do basically the same thing. 
uh, and all of these technologists are you know, fascinated by these new features that they put into them. Just don't worry about any of that. What matters is liquidity. Bitcoin has it, and the knockoffs do not. So if you, if you try to get into the Bitcoin movement and people try to get you into altcoins, just ignore that. That's, oh, excuse me. Somebody asked about Ethereum yesterday on my other talk. This is why, this is why Ethereum is, um, is BS. It's, it's just another. It's going to be hyped up, and some of the early adopters will make a ton of money. But it's, it's, just, like, it's just like a Facebook IPO. It's like you know, a, a company that doesn't ha it's not, that's not actually profitable, and it's, people buy into it even though there's no reason for it to have a high price. It's, it's going to have a hype cycle, and then people will forget about it again. But Bitcoin is what's important. That's, that's basically the point of that. So, okay. So I'm really skeptical of people who say that they know the future. So I, don't, I hesitate to say this because I think that I know the future. But basically, um, uh, it's, sort of, it's a theorem of Austrian economics that um, there, there's only one... There, you can't have an equilibrium between two currencies on the free market. Any, any two currencies, one, one of them is going to grow to, uh, and the other one will, will shrink down to nothing. Uh, because it's just more valuable to have one standard that everybody uses. Um, so, the, so, you know, as, as I was saying, liquidity, in, that, that makes the currency, that, that uh, that's the main value of a currency that you would, you would normally expect. But the odd thing about Bitcoin is that uh, it's less liquid than the dollar, but people are still moving from the dollar into Bitcoin, which you, you can see because of the, uh, the Bitcoin economy is growing so rapidly. So the odd thing about this is as people leave the dollar, they're making the dollar less liquid, that's not a big effect yet, but we'll definitely start seeing that eventually. And as people go into Bitcoin, they're making Bitcoin more liquid. So the fact that, that Bitcoin is winning, it's growing against the dollar, uh, means that it's becoming more competitive against the dollar. So whatever competitive advantage it had you know, a couple years ago is now much bigger. And there isn't, there isn't any end to this process. So, you know, what, you know, Austrian economics does not make predictions, but what we should expect, barring I don't know what, what but what we should expect is that uh, if Bitcoin is growing now, that's evidence that it will continue to grow because its competitive advantage is only increasing. And it should eventually defeat the dollar and, and all other currencies. Uh, but so I say, except barring black swan events. But now for the other Taleb reference, uh, Bitcoin is also anti-fragile. So I've been trying to think about, you know, what what's going to destroy it, and I haven't uh, haven't haven't thought of anything yet. Um, <coughs> keep keep in touch. I'll tell you the moment I, I figure out something. The biggest re weakness now is that we have, you know, very few core developers who, um, so we, we need to sort of distribute the development process a little bit more. Uh, but because of the anti-fragility anti of Bitcoin, you know, what, I'm, what I hope will happen is that we'll discover that the Bitcoin, Bitcoin Foundation has been infiltrated by the FBI or something. And then people are like, whoa, we better distribute the, dis the uh, development of Bitcoin, and then, then it'll happen. So the, People, you know, the government needs to work harder to destroy Bitcoin because that'll, that'll help it out a lot, basically. <laughs> oh, and we also need to get, um, you know, government officials and banksters invested in Bitcoin because then, you know, then they won't have, they won't be able to act against it at that point, too. So uh, try to get them to take uh, campaign donations in, in Bitcoin. Try to, try to get... Get, try to give it to their children or something, too. That'll help. <laughs> uh, so the Silk Road, what's one of our... This is um, a great crypto-anarchist community. It's sort of uh, the paradigmatic example now, I should say. It's, um, 
you, you, I mean, uh, so I don't, I don't get to hear enough about Ross Ulrich being a libertarian hero. I mean, I guess you probably hear a lot about that over here, but in the mainstream, in the press, we don't get that enough. Uh, so one of the most interesting things that I saw recently was an article on the Silk Road 2. Um, but what was interesting was if you read between the lines, they didn't mention in the article that the Silk Road is actually illegal. Because that part, that wasn't the interesting part anymore. So what, what we see now is the, the black market is sort of becoming normalized and it's just kind of a, an interesting business that people want to hear about, right? So this is, it's like they, they can put up a, 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 a storefront that looks totally respectable, except it'll have like crack cocaine on the front page. <laughs> and now people are just sort of interested in hearing about it. And I saw this article in the technology section of BBC News Online. And like it's, it's a technology uh, story now. It's like nobody cares about the elite that it's, you know, a bunch of evil drug dealers anymore. So we're, we're seeing the normalization of the black market because of this, this fact that people can, that people can just create businesses now that are, are illegal but just operate basically like normal businesses. So right now, um, now I'm going to talk about some of the next things that we need to fix. Basically, um, now, of course, I would recommend not putting any of your money in darknet businesses because they're illegal, of course. Uh, but another reason that you shouldn't put money in is because they can just disappear with the money. Like the reputation system, we libertarians like to talk about reputation. Experience has shown that this is not good enough. <laughs> People will just start a whole business and come up with advertisements and everything and the whole point is just to get people to uh, send them their money and then they just disappear with it. So we need some way to, to fix that. So fortunately, um, oh and of course institutions can be taken down. So we need, we need to get rid of institutions as much as possible. We need to keep big business just without the institutions, right? That's, that's what we need to work on here. So right now, um, the next big idea that I think so anyway, it's called Open Transactions. It's work, being worked on by Chris Odom. Uh, he's, I, you know, I don't know him that well, but I like to pretend he's a friend of mine. Um, so uh, it's transactions in, in liabilities. That means like uh, promises. Like it, it, for example, if, if Mountain Gox was using open transactions, you would have a, a liability representing a dollar. Basically, well, it's like a fiat fiat currency, right? Because you have you start with the fiat currency, the dollar that's already just a promise. Well, it's not even that. But it, then you have another one because it's on it's online, right? Um, and it's a promise to get a dollar out of Mountain Gox, which they haven't uh, haven't been able to honor. But if they were using open transactions, they would be able to prove uh, their. Uh, you, you would be able to prove who, who owed them money and, um, and you would be able to, to audit them just by viewing their receipts. Well, of course, you'd have to prove that they actually had, had the dollars on hand. You'd need to really, you know, physically audit them. But, but you can prove they, you know, uh, you, you can prove exactly who they, they owe money to. And of course, it's, um, it's built right on top of Bitcoin. So, um, you don't, you don't have that problem with Bitcoin. It's not, it's not even a liability in, in the open transaction system. And um, open transaction, oh yeah, I said that. It's basically a chow mein wet dream. Um, it, it does blind signatures and it does triple entry accounting. Um, it, it, it basically allows an institution to run a Bitcoin business without, um, with, with a lot less, less trust. Uh, so hopefully, well, what I hope will happen is that all of the darknet businesses start using it. There's also an idea called voting pools that I didn't mention in this slide, but it, it means that you can't hack into the business and take all of the bitcoins because the ability to transfer bitcoins is distributed across a number of institutions. 
So uh, I hope the darknet businesses will start using it first, and then people will start saying, why can't we have the same level of security on these you know, white market businesses that we can get on the black market businesses? <laughs> as long as the innovation comes, everybody knows that it's coming out of the black market, that's, that's a good thing. That's what we need to work on. So the ne another idea that's coming up next is Lex Cryptographia. Oh, well, one thing about open transactions is that, um, you know, somebody, somebody I know tried it recently and he found it very confusing. So that, that is a potential weakness and hopefully uh, they'll get a client that, uh, that anybody can use really easily. That's, um, uh, so this other idea, Lex Cryptography, it's built on top of open transactions in Bitcoin. Look it up. It's done by uh, Justice Ranvier. And... Um, the fundamental principle, it's, it's basically a legal system that is distributed, doesn't depend on the government at all. Uh, because we have Bitcoin now, we can have a, 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 a bond system that exists over the internet and is not, it d doesn't, doesn't require uh, coercive authority to enforce because all, all Bitcoin transactions are just they're just dig digitally signed messages, so if you can produce that, that's, that's all you need. So the way it works is when, when two people want to do business together, they will both put up a bond which they, cannot, uh, re which, which they can release once the business is done. They will also make an agreement with some, someone who acts as, uh, as a, 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 an adjudicator um, between them who will who has the ability to release the bond, but not run away with it. They only have the ability to release the bond uh, once, once the work is completed satisfactorily. And if it isn't completed satisfactorily, they can both talk to him and, and he decides how much of it goes to each person. It, it's basically just, it's just like what, you know, what, what we've been talking about in, for a while. And we can just do it. You know, it's going to exist soon. Anybody can use it. And you don't, you don't need to, you know, petition the state to allow it. You just go and just do it. And it's better than using the state legal system because it's cheaper. So eventually everybody will do it, whether or not they're, they're agorists. Well, they are agorists, just not ideological, right? Uh, oh, OK. I already talked about this normalization of the black market. We're already seeing some of that. It's fantastic. Um, so, future black market, you know, people, people are really starting to demand privacy and um, so I think we'll, we'll, well, I think we'll see Bitcoin adopted en masse just based on, you know, Austrian economics and uh, I think we'll see more use of Tor as well because people, people want, want that. You know, people, people want anonymity and protection that they can use easily. And so I think that the internet service providers will start, they'll start realizing that, you know, people want to have a Tor network that works really well. And we'll, we'll one, once, once we get Lex Cryptographia and uh, open transactions and Bitcoin sort of uh, uh, adopted, then we can move the whole stock market onto the internet just a distributed anonymous stock market, and it'll be cheaper than having a regular IPO, which costs like $40 million, you know, and you'll just go invest in, you know, you, you'll say, well, this drug cartel has been uh, offering dividends for the past <laughs> several years, so, but of course, this one, they could take over all of Nicaragua, they're up and coming, it's value investing versus growth. Um, that's, what we're, that's what we'll have, eventually. Um, right, so uh, yeah, people will be forced to be, I'm not talking about like the libertarian idea of force, right? This is the, this is the liberal concept of what force is, but people will be forced to be agorists because it'll be the only way to stay competitive. Um, well, when I say that that will happen, we actually have to, you know, make it happen, just to be clear. <laughs> It's not, you know, the, the joke like, how, how does a libertarian screw in a light bulb? You, you know, just the market just does it automatically. <laughs> That's... 
Um, so a, a good way of thinking about these ideas is uh, the capital goods of agorism. So when I was talking earlier, you know, agorism is only for small time stuff and um, agorism isn't for activists. When, when, when you have, when we have ideas about how to mass market the black market, how to make the black market easier for millions of people, uh, that, that can be produced by just a few people, a few coders, that's, that's the capital goods of agorism it, because it's more efficient. It's like building something that just makes everything a lot easier for everybody. So we're not just talking about small time things. Uh, you know, small groups and individual people can do really gigantic big things. And they're not even necessarily, necessarily illegal. Like, building open transactions, that's not, that's not illegal. Maybe people can do something illegal with it, but, you know, that's neither here nor there. Um, and so, okay, so this povertarian, that's a funny word that I learned recently that people use to make fun of the libertarians who are all about uh, localism and, you know, uh, opting out of the normal economy. We'll, we'll just have a local economy based on pot and moonshine. I'm sure they don't really believe that, but it's a funny joke. But you, you shouldn't have to deprive yourself to be an agorist. The, the agorist should be richer than the statists. Uh, and, and as long as we think in terms of these, you know, the capital goods of agorism, just trying to do, trying to do big things, as big as you, you're able, you know, then, uh, then that, that should happen. Um, should be, okay, yes. So uh, individual secession. So when people used to ask me about what's the best way to eliminate the government, I would usually say individual secession. We don't want to just destroy everything. Well, I mean, that'd be nice. But that would, that would, you know, when the government just collapses, that often leaves, has problems like, you know, but if we just let people secede one by one, they would, they would sort of build the new economy one person by person and uh, eventually be easier for more people to leave. Well, effectively, we're, we're building a system that allows for this. So, you know, I used to say, well, of course it won't happen that way. But actually, I think it is going to happen that way. We, we just don't have to petition the government for it. We just do it. Um, so someday, relatively soon, individual secession will be a thing that lots of people have as an option. So, you know, our, our job should be to make this like a meme, like something that people understand uh, is, is a thing. Um, keep, keep that idea alive. And so here's a reading list. So anyway, um, you know, my, my main point is that we need to integrate the cypherpunk ideas into the mainstream libertarian movement. Um, shouldn't be just an obscure thing. Libertarians need to be as good at cryptography as they are at Austrian economics. So we need, need to start working on that. Like now, get to work. What are you still sitting here for? So, you know, you, knew, you, know, you need to know your Austro-libertarian literature. Then, but then get straight into the cypherpunk stuff. So uh, applied cryptography, not, that's not really a cypherpunk book, but it's, really, it's the greatest introduction to cryptography. It's a really fun book. I enjoyed it a lot. And then we've got all of the, um, of the cypherpunk classics at nakamotoinstitute.org. Bas it's basically a reading list. That's what it is right now. Uh, yeah, it's there, yes. The uh, cypheronomicon. Cryptonomicon is the Neil Stevenson novel. Did I write it incorrectly earlier? No, 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 it's no, no, Cypheronomicon. No, no, no. Oh, okay. Well, so, well, we don't have uh, we don't have anything. So we don't have applied cryptography because apparently it is copyrighted, even though it's easily available online. Just search for it, and like the PDF is the first thing that comes up. Uh, so uh, we don't have any Neil Stevenson books because I believe those are actually copyrighted as well. But fortunately, the cypherpunks were ahead of the. <laughs> Uh, ahead of the mainstream libertarian movement on in terms of not believing in copyright. So we could just we just post we can just post anything we want that's cypherpunk there. And then I'm recommending these three blogs as you know as uh, places where 
uh, we're sort of merging the cypherpunk and austro-libertarian ideas. That last one is my blog, um, but they're all, well, the first two are definitely really good. Don't want to say that mine is really good, but it is. And um, so there, there you go. Thank you very much. We are running a little over, so uh, maybe just a couple of questions. Uh, who's got like the really awesome questions that can't be answered by Google? This, this okay. Guy, right? Just just find me outside afterwards. I'll be around. Uh, yeah, I was expecting this to be the hour and a half talk because I was anyway. It was just a miscommunication. But quick question. Yes. Uh, I think most of us are familiar so, some level with Bitcoin's open transaction was a surprise to me. How dependent is open transaction on the network effect? You know, Bitcoin is important, you know, that you know, yes. lots of people use it. Is open transaction also requiring the same kind of largely distributed, lots of users well, type there, situation? There isn't, yeah, there isn't any concept of liquidity for open transactions, open, because open transactions is not, it doesn't have its own, its own currency. It's built on top of Bitcoin. Uh, but of course there is a network effect in the sense that people have to know that it exists and that it's like a thing and they have to know how to use it, which that's, that, that's a potential problem because it, it, it is, it, it's, it's such a, it is a vast idea and it will require some education on the part of people to understand like you what it's actually. Do you a lot of people using it in order for it to work? No. You, ah. you just, you. You, you have a, a server that's basic, that signs receipts and anybody who wants to use it uh, may and it's, you know, a, and if they know how to use it, then that's just as good as if, well, it's not just as good. It's better if there are lots of servers, but, uh, but, uh, you, but you know, it's, it's, it's fine if, if you just want to do a smart contract just between you and a few other people. Uh, you, you don't need lots of other people using it. I'm going to usurp for a question for a minute and ask my own question. Okay. Uh, you, let me super. Toward the end, you said um, that you you that that it's not just going to happen on its own, right? That we need to kind of make this happen. This being uh, sort of uh, the implementation of uh, the various uh, crypto anarchic technologies. But um, also, throughout a lot of your slides, you kind of pointed to a lot of inevitability that these technologies seem to grow um, on their own. So what? What is it like? Is this a is this a part of nature that sort of grows on its own? And what do we have to do to water intend it in general? In a general sense. Okay. Well, um, you know, technology can be used for for good or evil, and there are there are better solutions and there there are worse ones, and there are much better things that we could do that we're not doing now, and if people knew about the better solutions, they could demand them as customers and they would happen a lot quicker. I mean, I think that when you've got an obviously better solution, it is, you should expect that it will happen eventually. We, but if people know about it, then they can start saying, where is it? You know, that's, that's, that's really the, the difference, I think. Other questions? So, um, you know, I'm all for black market and Silk Road's really cool and, and, and this is all future, but with uh, particularly Ross Albrecht, I, I read uh, that he tried to put a hit on another drug dealer or something. Is, is that true about him or is that made up state propaganda? How does it relate to the morals of the situation? Okay, well, um, uh, well, it, this is a very, this is a complicated situation. There. Uh, uh, the criminal complaint alleged that there were several hits, but only uh, I believe two of them actually are appearing in the um, in the, uh, the 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 prosecution, the in indictment. I don't remember exactly what the report is called. So it's possible that those other ones are completely nothing. Uh, we don't really know. One of these two that does appear to have some reality behind it was. Is, is a scenario entirely concocted by the, the FBI. It's basically, well, it's, it's entrapment, right? It's like you're, 
you're just bugging someone to, to sell you drugs until they finally do, and then you arrest them. And it's, it's creating a, a scenario in which an, an anarcho-capitalist who didn't have a distributed legal system to rely on would believe that you know, retribution w was necessary. Uh, and as to the other one, that may be real, it may be a concocted scenario, it may be nothing, I don't know. Uh, but, you know, when, 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 the, when the government tries to get people to do illegal things so that they can arrest them, they, you know, they're deliberately trying to concoct scenarios that makes, makes a person feel trapped, like they don't have any other choice. Uh, I mean, basically, I would say that, uh, you know, we don't know all the details yet, so, so hold off, off uh, judgment. Yes? Well, Sadly, I guess that, we... that is all the time we've oh, got okay. for now, uh, but, but 